Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mei Han, director of the Center for Chinese Music and Culture at Middle Tennessee State University. Welcome to today's event, 120,000 Stories, Nobuko Miyamoto, and her long song of relocation, race, love, and revolution. I am the facilitator for today's event. This event is co-presented by MTSU's Center for Chinese Music and Culture, Center for Popular Music, Center for Asian Studies, and June Anderson Center for Women and Non-Traditional Students. It is part of the MTSU celebration of the National Women's History Month. I want to use this opportunity to thank Dr. Greg Risch, Dr. Mike Novak, and Ms. Megan Whiffley, directors of these centers for their support and participation in this exciting event. Joining me is my teaching assistant and a musicology graduate student, Greta McGuire. A big thank to Greta for serving as tech support today. Our guest speakers are Ms. Nobuko Miyamoto and Dr. Deborah Wong. I will introduce Dr. Wong and ask her to introduce Ms. Miyamoto. Dr. Deborah Wong is an ethnomusicologist and a professor of music at the University of California, Riverside. She has conducted extensive research on the musics of Asian America and Thailand. She has written three books, Louder and Faster, Pain, Joy, and The Body Politic in Asian American Taiko. Second book, Speak It Louder, Asian Americans Making Music, and third, Sounding the Center, History and Aesthetics in Thai Buddhist Ritual. Dr. Wang is very active in academic and public sector work in the arts at the national, state, and local levels. She is the past president of the Society for Ethnomusicology and the chair of the Advisory Council for the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Currently, she holds positions on several editorial boards. So now it is my honor to welcome Dr. Wang and Ms. Nobuko Miyamoto. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mei Han. It's just so great to be with all of you today. It's just wonderful to look out and see all of your faces and some names that I know. So thank you all of you for coming. For the past several years, I don't know when it began exactly, but I've been following Nobuko Miyamoto around like a starstruck fan for eight to 10 years now. And at this point, we've done quite a bit of work together. And me following Nobuko in her projects is really part of a turn in the humanities, I would say, towards really emphasizing publicly directed, outwardly directed research, right? I no longer think of my research as being for me or for the furtherance of my own career, but rather about how can I lift up the work of people who would formerly be conceived of as informants, right? I simply don't think in those ways anymore. I'm a fan, I'm a witness, I'm a participant, right? I have very deliberately have positioned myself in that way and have learned a lot by doing so. A lot of my work has to do with race and gender, the fact that Professor May Han invited us today as part of Women's History Month means everything to me and to Nobuko. And of course, we think of the matter of women in the United States as being about not just gender, but also about all forms of difference, right? I personally am coming very much from a feminist of color perspective on all of these matters. Let me introduce Nobuko because today is really all about her. And my role here is simply to ask her some questions and you're gonna learn from her directly about how one can do the kind of community-based social justice work that she does as a woman of color. I'm always a little bit at a loss about how to 
<laughs> how to present, how to explain, how to introduce Nomical because she does so much and has done it for quite a while at this point. She's a true community-based artist. She's a true community-based artist. And you're going to learn more about what that can mean as she tells you about it today. She is a third-generation, multi-ethnic Japanese-American singer, songwriter, dancer, choreographer, and activist. And that will become very clear as we proceed. She's a legendary figure in the Asian American movement and absolutely well known in the JA, Japanese American and Asian American communities at this point. In 1973, she and Chris Ijima recorded what is widely regarded as the first album of very intentionally Asian American music. And we'll come back to that as we proceed today. Um, it was titled A Grain of Sand and it's a really important album that's still very much listened to and taught Nomoko is the founder and artistic director of Great Leap, which is a community-based nonprofit organization in Los Angeles. And it's now over 40 years and has a long history of doing incredible community-based work. Nomoko is, how could I say, she is not only widely known, but she is beloved in the Asian American community across the United States. She is regarded as a mover, as a shaker and as a compassionate visionary, she teaches us through music and dance. She teaches us to stand up for social justice. She teaches us how to name injustice. She teaches us how to connect respectfully across difference. A lot of her work has been dedicated to just that. And all of it is taught. She teaches us through music and through dance. She always has several projects going at the same time. But I should say that 2021 is a particularly significant year for Nobuko Miyamoto. Two things are happening this year. One has already happened. A big double album of her music has come out, it dropped at the end of January from Smithsonian Folkways recordings. It's, um, it's readily available through Smithsonian Folkways, also to be found on Spotify, Apple Music, all the usual places. You're going to hear a bunch of songs from that double album today. And also in June, her full-length memoir, her book, is going to drop from the University of California Press. It's a full length of her life story. And it's incredible. It's moving. You're going to hear just a little bit of it today. So what can I say? You need to hear from Nobuko herself because she tells her own story. She sings her own story in really compelling and beautiful and moving and inspiring ways. So welcome. Welcome, Nobuko Miyamoto. <laughs> oh, thank you for that illustrious uh, introduction. Uh, uh, it's my honor to be here. Um, and I hope you're all doing okay, that you're warm and cozy and uh, you know, surviving in this crazy uh, time that we've been through in the last year. Even though I can't be there in person, I, I just feel like this is giving us an opportunity to have conversation and a sort of more, more intimate sharing. And so I'm not going to talk a lot right now. I'm just going to go into a song because that's the best way to uh, open a conversation sometimes. We are the children of the migrant worker. We are the offspring of the concentration camp. Sons and daughters of the railroad builder who leave their stamp on America. We are the children of the Chinese waiter born and raised in the laundry room. We are the offspring of the Japanese gardener, that's me, who leave their stamp on America. Sing a song for ourselves. What have we got to lose? Our 
foster children of the Pepsi generation. Cowboys and Indians ride red and ride. Watching war movies with a next door neighbor. Secretly rooting for the other side. of the freedom fighter brothers and sisters all around the world we are a part of the third world people who will leave their stamp on America we will leave our stamp on America we will leave our stamp on America America first songs that Chris Ijima and I wrote in 1970. Before that time, really, Asian Americans, we didn't have a song that sang our story. We were known, Japanese Americans especially, were known as the quiet Americans. Growing up without a song, what does that do to a person? What does it do to not see and hear your stories? Um, and that's the way I grew up. Um, I was a child of relocation, um, two years old when they uh, forcefully removed us from our homes. So I sort of was a lost, felt like a lost child. I was very quiet, uh, and I, and I didn't, I didn't know where home was. Uh, we moved around as refugees, really, in the country from Santa Anita Racetrack to, to Montana to Idaho and then finally to Utah, Ogden, Utah, where my father, who loved music, in celebration of us being released in, in Utah, our home was in Los Angeles, took me and my mother to my first concert of music. And that was when my whole world lit up. To hear live music, to, to hear an orchestra playing was for me, my world turned into living color. And I wanted to somehow embody that music. So I went home and I listened to my father's favorite records and I, and I danced around the house. I was four years old and my mother saw that and she, there was a little dance school in Ogden, Utah. She took me there. And that was the beginning of my journey to be a ballerina. And mm -hmm. my mother, because, because this is women's, I've been thinking a lot of my mother and women in general and their role in, in nurturing and, and bringing us up. So as we do this, I want you to think about your mothers. I want you to think about your grandmothers. I want you to think about the women around you uh, and what differences they've made in your life. So my mother would show me pictures of some of the great ballerinas who were not white. Uh, Sono Osato was half Japanese and half Irish. Uh, Maria Tallchief, she was a Native American from Oklahoma. She was a ballerina. Uh, Alicia Alonso from Cuba, she was Latino, Latina. So I grew up, my mother actually saw that 
being a ballerina or being a dancer was the one place a woman could be queen. And she encouraged me and my father, of course, loved music. So they encouraged me. And, and that was a way that I felt like I had found my home, a place, a place to be on a stage with music. And that was the beginning of my journey. And I thought by being a dancer, you know, that I would just have a chance to make it in this world. And, and as I, when we moved back to Los Angeles and I got training and I got a scholarship at American School of Dance in Hollywood, it, I was about 12 or 13 years old. And Mr. Loring, the director said, in order for you to get a job as a dancer, you have to be twice as good as everybody else. So that was my wake up and that, wait a minute, you know, even though I was, I, I would have to be twice as good, even though I had this elite training, this rigorous training in ballet, and modern dance, uh, it still wouldn't have helped me uh, unless I was twice as good. And I did start working when I was 15 in a, in a musical called uh, King and I in a movie and, and a, a couple of other movies. And, I, and I, then I got a Broadway show uh, called Flower Drum Song. And I was on the stage of uh, a Flower Drum Song singing a song called Chop Suey. And I looked out of the audience and I went, they were looking at me like <laughs> in a way that I felt uncomfortable actually. And then I realized that for these people, I was like chop suey. I was Chinese food for white people. That's what this performance was. And so this sort of started me on a journey to, to say, well, what about, what are the stories of my people? Why, why aren't those stories on the stage? Why aren't those stories in the movies? I did one, I did cross the colored border uh, in one film, it was called uh, West Side Story, where I passed for Puerto Rican. But uh, other than that, uh, I was, Puerto, you know, in this sort of box of being this image of the Asian woman that was from the European American uh, perspective. So that started me on the journey to really uh, try to seek a way to express myself in a more full manner. And, and it happened to be that I, I got a singing coach who was African-American, Dini Clark, and he started exposing me to black music, <laughs> exposing me to uh, uh, Lena Horn and, and, and uh, Nina Simone and, and Ella Fitzgerald. And I, and I thought, wow, these are powerful women. These women fully express who they are. Yes, they, they, they had to endure indignities. They couldn't sing, they couldn't stay in the same hotels they were singing at. They had to fight a lot of discrimination. They had to be twice as good also. But that gave me sort of the impetus to, to and the energy and the inspiration to move forward. Uh, as a as a as a as a woman, so that was a beautiful sort of synopsis of a you know a journey you know on your part. I mean, um, you're extensively trained in music and dance as um, you know a young woman. Um, you were also extremely aware of being a, a, a Japanese American. You know, being not white basically, you know, for real reasons, like the Japanese American incarceration was one of those reasons, right? Then you were told over and over again that you were not white, right? Um, and then in the late 1960s, you had a certain kind of um, political awakening, what have yes. you. The song you just shared with us was written, what, around 1970, I think? 1970. So, yeah. so uh, in New York City, I was exposed uh, and met a woman, her name was Yuri, Kojiyama. And she was Japanese American. She was also had experienced camp. 
uh, and but uh, when she was released from camp, she and her husband decide uh, that they were going to live in Harlem. Uh, even though she was from San Pedro, California, uh, she wanted to learn what it was to be in a black community. And she raised six children <laughs> living in Harlem. Uh, and uh, they went to you know freedom schools this is during the 60s she she met malcolm x uh and she became an activist and and a border crosser really she she both was part of the asian mo movement asian american movement but she was also participating in the black movement and also in the puerto rican movement anyway she brought me she invited me to a meeting of asian americans for action and in that meeting i met for the first time activists who were Japanese American, Chinese American, younger people, and older people who were, you know, very much involved. Unlike my parents who were, my parents, their idea of, of, of moving ahead was just keeping their heads down and let's forget about camp, let's just move forward, you know, let's just try to do the best we can. But in New York, these were people who were aware of what had happened who knew the, about injustice and were going to speak out about it. So it happened to be that one of those people was Chris Ijima, who could play guitar and could sing. And he had a soulful voice. So we just really stumbled in at a, at a meeting in Chicago that we had from the East and West Coast Asians coming together for the first time. We met with Black Panthers. Uh, who had just lost their leader, uh, Fred Hampton. And if you haven't seen the movie, uh, uh, Judas, Judas and the Black Messiah, which is on Netflix right now, you should see that movie. Um, anyway, we were there right after Fred Hampton had gotten murdered. We met with Native Americans there. And suddenly we were filled with this, the sense that we were a part of something bigger than ourselves. And the song came out and, and we realized, oh my God, we've never had our own song. And the people who heard us sing, it was like this revelation, you know? So we thought, hey, we need to keep doing this. Um, and so we became sort of like troubadours and we moved around the country, uh, you know, from one Asian community to the next and really told the stories of what was going on in the communities uh, the activism and, and uh, involvement that people had in trying to change their communities and serve their communities. So that's how it all started in 1970. And it was a three year journey that we spent together doing that. Um, and I really reconceptualized my idea of what an artist could and what art could do. Mm, uh, who it's for. Yes. We're going to have a Q&A session, both in the middle and at the end, because Nobuko is nothing if not interactive. And what she's just told us is a very compelling story about how communities learn from one another, and especially communities of color. The ways in which Nobuko, you are rooted in both the Asian American and African American and even Latinx communities over time, and very intentionally so. We could keep going and We Are the Children because it's such an important song. And it, yeah. honestly, people, it's like an anthem for, for Asian Americans. I mean, it is, it is very well known. And in fact, Nobuko recorded a new version of this historic song on, on the Smithsonian Folkways album that just dropped. But maybe let's turn to another song because not your buddy. Butterfly is kind of important, <laughs> okay. right? It's, so, it's Women's yeah. History Month. So this is Women's History Month. And um, I saw last year, I, or the year before, I saw these posters uh, on the street near where I lived about Madame Butterfly, the opera, Puccini opera. And this image of Madame Butterfly, the, the tragic figure who was in love with a uh, you know, this European American or European man and, and he left her and she was with child and it was this tragic story, you know. So this story, the, this story has been repeated through our culture, through uh, the world of Susie Wong, uh, Miss Saigon, and many movies and, and dramas. You know, the idea of this lovely, soft, sweet, 
forgiving, you know, geisha. And um, I said, that has been plaguing us. I need to uh, I do a response to it. And so this song is <laughs> antidote. Um, <laughs> an antidote. Uh, it's personal. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more after we actually do it. So here it is. I'm not your butterfly. I'm not your picture bride. I am a samurai woman who holds up half the sky. I have unbowed my head. I have unbound my feet. I have endured the heat. I'm not afraid to leap. I am. I am. I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I have crossed waters wide. I have climbed mountains high. I carried you inside my heart when I took a stride. I am your memory, stories of you and me, moment of breaking free, so you can be, you can be, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. I do not know my age, I am born every day, my spirit can't be gauged, I'm living to create, I am. I am, I am, I am, I am. I'm a grandmother, I'm a barefoot gardener, a lover, a healer, I'm a memory keeper. I am a dancer, I'm a freedom believer. I am a seeker, I am a cultural weaver, I am. I am, I am, I am, I am. I'm not your butterfly, I'm not your picture bride. I am a samurai woman who holds up half the sky. I have unbowed my head, I have unbound my feet, I have endured the heat, I'm not afraid to leave. Hey, hey, I am, I am, I am. I am a woman who holds up half the sky. You are the women who hold up half the sky. We are the women who hold up half the sky. We are the women who hold up half the sky. You are the women. <laughs> <laughs> Good song. <laughs> so I should say to everyone who's here that you're hearing like the solo unplugged version of these songs on the album. There are, you know, there are lots of other musicians and, you know, studio producers and all that. Um, so you're getting kind of a gift today to hear them in this Nobuko stage. at the piano version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where this song was created, uh, by the way. This is ah. my uh, living room studio and uh, this is the piano. I have to say that this piano, again, is a gift to me. I, I had an old upright uh, that my grandmother, it was my grandmother's uh, uh, piano, but somebody in the last few years gave me this baby grand that belonged to a, a black music teacher, a woman in Chicago. It's a Julius Brower piano, and it's much too good for me, but I try to live up to what this piano and what the meaning behind it and the, the history behind it has been. But because I want to raise up the, uh, the idea of women uh, this month and uh, this, this time, you know, we're in a time of people, the Me Too generation and, and recognizing patriarchy and the damage it's done in the world. And I'm thinking that we need to not just fight against something, but we need to put up and raise up the women goddesses that we have around us. The strength and the beauty of, of women who have been fully expressing and, belie and, and believing, following their beliefs, uh, you know, from, uh, in the black struggle, uh, and, and even 
are great singers like Nina Simone and Billie Holiday who, who have expressed ideas uh, that have really moved our consciousness. And um, so I want to raise them up as sort of modern day goddesses, you know, and, and, and uh, think about our own lives, uh, women around us who, who have given us inspiration. So I just read in the paper today, I got inspired by some women in Myanmar, who is Burma, who have been on the front lines uh, because they're in a military coup right now. And these women are really on the front lines. I mean, they're hanging their, their uh, what do they call the wrap that they wear? Um, sarong. Yeah. Sarongs. Yeah. And making curtains that, that the, they're daring to the military not to cross because there's a, a story that if, if uh, a male crosses the space where a female menstruation has happened, that they will lose their power. So they're hanging their sarongs uh, and making curtains to keep, and they're, they're using their kitchen knives to create, uh, you know, defenses against the military. And this one a grandmother said, I am going to make sure that my grandchildren do not have to live another year under the military. So these women are sacrificing themselves mm -hmm. so that their children and grandchildren can be free. So this is now, today, this is yesterday, you know. And um, so th this is the kind of world we live in. And, and yes, uh, it's a me too world, but it's also them, you know. Uh, who have not had privilege, who have not had opportunity, who have not had education, and still uh, stand up. It's so striking. I mean, women of color, feminists of color know especially like how easy it is to get written out of history, you know, or yes. not written in to begin with, right? You know, these kinds of issues. Um, and it struck me over and over again how careful women and feminists of color often are to acknowledge where they get their ideas and lessons from, you know, they're less likely to present themselves as having come up with something all by themselves, you know, and so your your music does that continuously. And in fact, your memoir too, you're, you're constantly mentioning, you know, like, how you were inspired by or working with, you know, other people, you know, usually from communities of color, right? You know, so I love what's going on in this song. Um, how does it relate to, you know, in the US, um, anti-Asian violence kinds of issues right now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're living in this moment um, where Asians, you know, in Los Angeles, in Oakland, mm -hmm. in New York City are being attacked uh, just for being who they are, blamed for the virus and uh, targeted and sometimes brutally beaten. Um, a friend of mine was brutally beaten in uh, Oakland. Uh, so we just want to make people aware. Uh, it's nothing new, actually. Um, this, we've had a history of this in the United States since we've been here. But we're not really included, you know, with black and brown people when they talk about violence against uh, Americans. And we are Americans, but we're not looked at, many times we're not looked at as Americans. Um, so, uh, yes, this is a moment <laughs> when this is happening. And, and again, I'm gonna, I, I wanna do another song that um, was inspired by people uh, in 2019, uh, people who were children like I was in concentration camp and, and Fort Sill, uh, I think it's in Arkansas, I'm not sure. Was a was a place where they held Japanese Americans, and and they were planning to use that facility, which is still in operation, uh, for children at the border, for asylum seekers at the border. So people Jap of Japanese American descent uh, were standing up to to say, no, this is going to stop, and they've gone on a campaign of creating the uh, origami 
folded cranes, which represent peace and wishes for peace. Uh, and they've been gone on for the last two years. Using their experience to talk about what's going on now. So, you know, that's what we all have to do. And we've all had suffering. All of our families have, have gone through hardships and sufferings. How do we use that to grow our compassion so that we can support others who are weaker than we are or in a bad situation? So this is called uh, 120,000 Stories, which is the name of the album uh, that I, I just recently released with the Smithsonian. <clears throat> and it's uh, 120,000 is the number of Japanese Americans that were uh, forcefully removed from their homes during World War II. But it also represents the, the untold stories around us that need to be told. So this song um, uh, combines in two, in two verses of uh, Japanese American experience and then moves on to um, what's going on to people at the border. A hundred twenty thousand stories. Buried in the sand, a hundred twenty thousand stories. A hundred twenty thousand stories buried in my skin. A hundred twenty thousand stories. They called it camp, but it wasn't summer. Wind and sand blew away our lives. I was two years old. Potential spy at Santa Anita racetrack where the rich once watched their horses run. We slept in a horse stall. A soldier watched us with his gun. Oh, Kuroja. Oh, Kuroja. Sadao wanted to swim, but they said no Japs allowed. He joined the U.S. Army to make his family proud. Well, he fought in Italy. His family was held in Manzanar. He never made it back, but he got the Medal of Honor. Whoa, whoa, good old job. Oh, good old job. Stolen dreams, stolen rights, stolen land, stolen lives. It's an old story. Divide and separate. It's an old story happening today. In a cage sits Olivia. Plastic blanket, bed of stone, 2,000 miles her mother took her from the violence of her home. A hostage now, 300 children, scared and alone, asking, Donde esta mi mama? Donde esta mi mama? Oh, 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 is this detention or is it prison? The crime a better life for his children. Fifteen years Pedro worked in sacrifice, swept away in an instant by ice. Who made this border? Who decides who goes, who stays? In this land that once was his home, in a prison he prays. In a prison he prays. No wall can hold my spirit, no law can steal my dreams, no hate can stop this song. Freedom, 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 oh freedom. A hundred twenty thousand stories.
buried in the sand. 120,000 stories buried in my skin. Buried in my skin. I just want to talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma. Because that's why people stood up. Japanese Americans stood up because they understood what intergenerational trauma is and what these children at the border are living through now is going to affect them their whole lives and their children. There are people that I've met who are grandchildren of people who were encamped and they still feel the impact of that experience. So it's a wonder that we are as, as sane as we are in this you know, world. Um, but it's only really, my feeling is by standing up for justice and facing into these difficulties and complicated stories that we gain our sanity, we gain our health, we gain our humanity. And that's why I keep singing. <laughs> I'm an OG, you know. <laughs> I didn't never thought I'd be singing at 80 years old these songs, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, I didn't even think about it. But, you know, right now, I think it's an important moment for me to, to tell these stories because I know them and I've lived them. And I, and I have grandchildren that I want uh, to know and to and to carry that legacy forward. So, <laughs> okay. I'm oh going. my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, Noviko. Um, Again, that's the title song for the new album from Smithsonian Folkways, 120,000 Stories. Michael Heffley, thank you for asking the question. It was a great lead in. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, the song is powerful, not least because you connect you know, past injustice with current injustice, right? You, you know, it could not be more deliberate on your part. Um, and that phrase that comes up several times in the song, you know, buried in my skin, I mean, where you really speak to the lived experience of injustice and intergenerational, the, the intergenerational persistence of trauma, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. so powerful, so powerful. Folks, I've noticed that there's a couple of other questions in the chat, and I, again, we invite you to, to, to keep, them, keep them coming. Um, Selena asked, uh, Nobuko, what was your process for writing Not Your Butterfly, or indeed any of these songs, but she wants to know about Not Your Butterfly. How did you write it? How did you? Well, it was a form of protest at first. I, I, my first instinct was to write a song called Kill the Butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> but then I said, oh, that might be misunderstood. And as a, an environmentalist, I didn't think that was a good idea. But uh, yeah, I started looking at my, my own history and my, my family. And my great-grandmother happened to be a samurai woman who did sort of make decisions for the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a powerful figure that I didn't know, really, I didn't know very much about until I went back to Japan um, maybe 20 years ago. And, and I started learning about this history that my mother told me, my mother was actually raised my, by my great grandmother because uh, my mother was born in Oakland, but life was really hard for my grandparents here. Uh, and so they sent the two girls back to Japan. My mother was just an infant, and my my aunt was like three years old. So they were raised by their great grandmother, by their grandmother, and um, so I only heard stories these these stories. And she is another woman that I I see as a, a as a figure of of a matriarch who made decisions like she would take the children. She says, I'm going to take you to the Christian church. You should be Christian because you're going to live in America. 
And then she crossed over and went to the Buddhist temple, her Buddhist temple. So she kept thinking about how are you going to live in the future? And she prepared for, for that. And uh, so anyway, I, I wanted to, uh, to bring my grand, great-grandmother into the song just to recognize her. And, um, and you know, and, and then I'm a grandmother now. So, you know, these are, this is part of my story. And I am a memory keeper. I, I wanted sure. to pass on to my uh, grandchildren and beyond uh, a sense of connection. Because as a, as a Japanese-American third generation, I just sort of lost, I don't speak Japanese. I, you know, I lost a, a connection, a direct connection with my culture. Mm. And part of being in the movement, what it has done for me, has given me an opportunity to go back and really learn who, what happened to my people and mm -hmm. uh, what is my story. So... Um, Anyway, that was my process. The musical process was more simple. Um, it was, you know, some of you, of course, are musicians and musicologists. My music is very, you know, diverse. It's not based on Japanese, uh, you know, chords necessarily, except this one. This is sort of a, uh, comes from a Japanese uh, obon, you know, shamisen, drum, you know, it's, it's sort of based on that. But then when I started hearing it, it sounded, it's, it sounded like American folk music also, you know. So there is a sort of familiarity uh, where folk music is folk music, uh, very simple chords. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't really, actually, this album is the first time I ever played the piano for myself in a few of the songs. Usually, I give it to Derek Nakamoto, and he will play it. But he said, no, I want you to play, you know. So I played uh, 120,000 stories for myself. I played an another couple songs you will hear in, the few, uh, in this uh, on, for the p on the piano by myself. So being uh, another thing I want to say is that I'm not a touring artist. I don't have a band, <laughs> so this music really comes out of, of a different kind of experience than what most people make music, you know, and you're from near Nashville, you know, the capital of the heartbeat of uh, American music, and, um, but, so it really comes out of community, and, um, and what I learned from being part of a community, I just want to say that I, after I, left New York and came back to LA after the movement, I went to a Buddhist temple uh, somebody took me and, and um, the, the reverend offered me this space to teach dance and um, at Senjin Buddhist temple in South Central LA. And that place became sort of a, my home where I could create and teach as well as learn more about who I was as a Japanese American, because I didn't know that much about my own culture and my own traditions. Hmm. And so should we move on to the motainai? Or should, or yeah, maybe question? So, well, there's several other great questions. And I should just okay. say that um, maybe let's hold them because um, 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 uh, Greta, your question about using her Noboko using her dance background and activism. Oh, why, yes, she does. And we'll get to that when we um, talk about Fandango Obon. Wouldn't that make sense? Yeah. Um, um, and um, there are several other questions. Folks are curious about literally how do you make this work? How do you, you know, what inspires it and how do you make it? So let's sort of touch on those things as we proceed. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's move to Motainai. What do you think? Okay. So this song is um, actually started me thinking about the environment uh, about uh, almost 20 years ago, actually, uh, and why wasn't our cultures looked at as a source of environmental wisdom. Uh, and we grow up hearing from our grandparents a word called motainai, which means it's a shame to waste nature. Uh, it's a shame to waste. It's a shame to waste time. It's a, you know, it's a shame to, if, that you didn't finish eating your food, <laughs> you know. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a really uh, 
a great word and a great concept. And then I looked it up in the internet and I saw that Wangaris Matai, who was a Kenyan uh, Nobel Prize winner for planting two million, uh, getting women to, here we are, women, women planting trees in Kenya to, because Kenya has one of the lungs of the earth and they need to preserve their fo uh, forest there. And motainai was a word that she heard when she toured in Japan and she started using it. She says, this reflects African values as well. So I thought, okay, I wanna write this song because it will also reach across to uh, Africans and, um, and reinforce this idea that people of color have something to add to the environmental conversation. So, and we were talking about musical form also. So in this, yeah. you're going to see, because I was part of the Buddhist temple, I was asked to write uh, obon, an Obon song in uh, English. Now Obon is, is, are these circle dances that we do to remember our ancestors. And every summer, you know, there's a season where we get together and we perform these dances. And usually there's a shamisen player that plays the music and a drummer, uh, a taiko, small taiko drum and a big heartbeat drum and singers who chant and, and sing the songs. So this is in that style of Japanese uh, style, but you know, stretched out a little bit to be more modernized, but it's in English and Japanese. And, uh, and I created an obon song that people dance so that not only were they, uh, could people hear the music, but they could also dance the words and, and, um, and put it in their bodies. Because I feel that when you put something in your body that you really, it, it affects you, your total being. So anyway, this is a fun video, but it was a way to reach out to my community and beyond to talk about Motai Nai. <laughs> We take, we take, we use, we throw away We take, we take, we use, we throw away
plastic and paper and bottles and cans. Garbage you make with your own two hands. Landfills filling, ocean you're killing. All this trash is making me illin. I'm really not a rapper. I know, you're a container. Get it? Rapper, container. Remember what Bob John used to say. What a waste, what a shame, what you throw away. Oh, that's such a good song. And Novako, I need to tell the audience that um, you may not know this, but up and down the West Coast, this song and dance are, are performed by tens of thousands of Japanese Americans at Obon ceremonies every summer at the various Buddhist temples up and down, you know, the West Coast. Um, many, many thousands of people know this song and the dance that go with it. So, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's part of part of Japanese American popular culture at this point. I want to bring in another uh, woman warrior. Yeah. Uh, my my mother in law, uh, Mamie Kirkland. Mamie Kirkland was uh, born in uh, Ellisville, Mississippi, and at the age of seven, she had to flee Mississippi with, because her father and his friend was being threatened with a lynch, lynching. <clears throat> now, Mamie, uh, this was in. Mamie was born in 1908. She lived to be 111 years old. She just died last year. But she had uh, faced, you know, so much in her life. Uh, but she, she became just this amazing, wonderful, loving. She raised nine children uh, in Buffalo, New York, after she uh, escaped the South. Uh, and she, but she always told the story about this man, a friend of her father's who had to go back, who did go back to Mississippi and he was lynched. And, and my husband was like, really? Is this, I've been hearing this story all my life, but I didn't know if it was really true or just sort of part of the family lore. But he went on a website of the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama. And sure enough, he put in Ellisville, Mississippi, and boom, this article comes up that says, you know, lynching of John Hartfield is going to happen tomorrow at, at 12 o'clock, blah, blah, blah. And he going, oh my God, this is what my mother's been telling about. And then he knew at that moment, he needed to take her back to Mississippi, that she needed to tell this story. 
At first she resisted, but then finally she gave in because she was looking at the newspapers in the morning with me at the table and seeing what was going on and, and, the, and, the, and the killings of, of black men and the, and the church in South Carolina. Um, so she said, I need to go back with him because what's going on now is the same thing that was going on then. And, and she realized that she needed to tell her story. So we took her back there and I was able to stand on the very spot where, where John Hartfield was murdered before 10,000 people. And we formed a circle on that spot and she was holding my hand. And she said, that could have been my father. The, the next spring, Equal Justice Initiative asked her to come and speak at their fundraiser. And at 108 years old, she got up there. And she said, this, this is to a crowd of 600 New Yorkers, mostly lawyers. She said, I left, when I left uh, Mississippi, I was a frightened little child, but I'm not frightened anymore. And she said, we have a lot of work to do. She pointed to her audience and she said, we have a lot of work to do. Notice she said, we, at 108 years old. She lived a few more years after that. And, and my husband has made a film called 100 Years from Mississippi, which soon will be out, a uh, documentary. And <clears throat> I want to, so this song really comes from that story. Uh, and my family's story, uh, as well as what, what I was seeing in the world outside, that Black Lives Matter. I wanna share this with you. Dirty secrets lie in the shadows Waiting for the light Talking story round kitchen table Clear as black and white Black and white Black and white How many lives have been taken How many names we don't know How many locked up in cages Brother, he's my husband, he's my lover, she's my sister, she's my mother, she's my friend, she's my other, he's my son, my brother, he's my husband, he's my lover, she's my sister, she's my mother, she's my friend, she's my other black life. to me since slavery and lynching since don't have a Chinaman's chance since cowboys told the Indians your land is my land your land is my land this system gives permission to the one with the biggest gun Remember David and Goliath, little David won, David won, little David won. In the moonlight, dawn, the sun, Baltimore or Ferguson, and your home or in the hood, Compton or Hollywood, in the alley or your car, Charleston or New York, in the subway or the street, Brooklyn or Royal High. He's my husband, my lover. 
She's my sister, my mother, my friend. He's my son. He's my brother. He's She's my husband. My He's my lover. She's my He's my son. She's my mother, my brother, my friend, my other husband. He's my son. He's my brother. He's my husband. He's my lover. She's my sister. She's my mother, my friend, my other. In the moonlight or the sun, Baltimore or Ferguson, in your home or in the hood, Compton or Hollywood, in the alley or your car, Charleston or New York, in the subway or the street, Brooklyn or Boyle Heights. Hey, oh. You can see this online if you if you go on uh, YouTube. Yeah. Oh, Nobuko, that song could not be more personal for you, right? Um, exactly. You know, your, your investments, you know, in your life, you know, in the Black community and other communities is real, is sustained. And um, I really, I, I want you to share with the audience your latest project, now eight years old, Fandango Bon which is yes, all so, about crossing communities, right? Yes. So uh, this, uh, a few years ago, eight years ago, <clears throat> we started, uh, I, because I'm a practitioner uh, of Obon, I met uh, Quetzal Flores, who is a practitioner of Fandango, which comes from Veracruz, Mexico. You, you musicologists know about Fandango, and that it's another, uh, form of tra a tradition of, of circle uh, where people make music together and, and, and improvise songs. And when I saw uh, Fandango, I went, oh my gosh, that's sort of similar to Obon. But we dance around the uh, a platform, whereas the musicians in Fandango play around the platform. And I said, I wonder what would happen if we, if we put Fandango and Obon together. And Quetzal said, yes. So this was the beginning of a festival we, where we wrote a, a, a bambutu, which you'll see at the very end. But uh, I want to share this festival with you because it just shows how music and, and dance participatory art can, can help communities to really meld together and really understand each other in a deeper way. So we've been continuing this project for the last eight years and hopefully it will become a, a different kind of a tradition that will carry us into the future. So let me just share this.
Andango Obon is a gathering of three distinct cultures, the West African, the Mexican uh, Songharocho culture, and the Obono Dori, which is Japanese Buddhist traditions. This is our third year, and each year the circle is getting more and more diverse. As long as the energy is really good, it's very simple to collaborate. And you know, everyone has their own instruments from wherever their country is. They all have the same roots when you really think about it. Mandango, Obon, Polycultural Remix, Jam and a Prayer, Angelino Souls, Transforming Ethnic Borders, Birthing a New World. We're building an idea that it's a good thing for people of different cultures to come together and to convene in a way that's maybe unusual actually because they actually get to participate in another form that's uh, different from theirs but then they can also see, oh, you know, there's similarities about this too. We want people to feel comfortable crossing borders into other communities. It don't matter who you are or what you do in your life. If you walk down that street and you see all these people right here doing this beautiful thing, <laughs> oh, I swear you're you gonna, gonna wanna it. jump you in. You're gonna feel it. Yeah. so many different ethnicities coming together and having such a wonderful experience. Yeah! We hope that we will encourage uh, other communities of color to really deal with stuff about the environment. Uh, that's what this is about, connection to the earth. We're trying to instill in people the idea that they can, anybody can participate, and they should. We're democratizing the arts. We're, we're saying everybody should participate. And in a sense, this returns us to the circle of our origins, of our beginnings. I wish we could all be there right now. Well, <laughs> that would we, be the best we, way to. Yeah, we, right? we missed it this year <laughs> because, of course, uh, we couldn't do it uh, because of the uh, virus. And uh, yeah. we hope that by the end of this year that we'll be able to come back in the circle. Right, right, because right. It, we need to. <laughs> we need to. We need it. And I just want to say, Nobuko, that, I mean, Fandango Obon, yes, it's fun. It's like, you know, it's a great thing to go to and participate in. But what I most love about it is that it is an actual model for how to connect communities across difference. And it is not some sort of corporate multicultural, you know, sort of we all vanish into the oneness of humanity kind of no. model. No, it's about respecting and understanding differences, right? You know, and, exactly. and yet finding connection. When we first wrote the first song, um, Bambutsu, which you'll see at the very end when we close, Reverend Kodani, Reverend Maas, the, the one who brought me into the Buddhist temple, met with us, Quetzal and, and, and Martha and myself, and said, it shouldn't be a fusion. It should be a conversation. So we don't want to melt our, our, you know, our borders. We know that those distinctions of our traditions exist. 
let's use those to create conversation and recognize and, and, and recognize the beauty of our differences. I, 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 the, you know, there's lots of questions at this point in the chat. I'd like the audience to, oh, well, we should, but we should also hear just one short passage, please, 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 from your memoir, because oh, you end the book. I okay. know you don't really want to do this, but I've asked for okay, you. Okay, I'm going to just read Thank this you for last little me. <clears throat> She's reflecting on, you know, being at Fandango Obon just a few so years the, ago. I'm right? going to just read you the last paragraph of this that I, um, so the book really, talks about my experience as a community artist and my journey, my long journey, uh, and a rich journey that it's been. But this is leading into Fandango Boom. In an age in which most of us spend too much time observing the world through our rectangular devices, <laughs> to step into the circle of Fandango Boom is a potent communal act. In this circle, we reclaim our power, our creativity. We make music with our own hands, our own voices. We circle the earth with our feet and remember we belong to it. In this circle, everyone is equal. Everyone is seen. Everyone has a place to be. In this circle, there are no borders, no us and them. There is plenty of room for more circles. In this circle, we weave our many roots, knowing our diversity is our strength. In this circle, we are enacting the world we want to live in. In this circle, we are enacting the world we want to live in. Again, everyone, Nobuko Miyamoto's uh, memoir will come out in June, and I really urge you to to read it. It's a great read. It's an inspiring read. Oh, no, because there's so, so many great issues to talk about. Oh, there's many questions. Uh, the question, I don't know if you can see them, but, um, but I sure can. Um, and, and really, it's a matter of like, where does one start? Because they're all great questions. Thank you, everyone, for, for dropping them in. Um, maybe we should come back to that matter of what does it mean to be Japanese American and to be using some Japanese music and dance ideas. Um, how, do you, how do you, you know, create that bridge through your work? Or is that what you're doing? For carefully. Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I, you know, I would never have uh, uh, dared to myself uh, do an Obon piece. It was only because I was asked to do it. And I told Reverend Moss, hey, I don't know that much about Japanese music. And he gave me a bunch of tapes to listen to. And then I carefully, you know, crafted listening to the chord structures and uh, the, I mean, the, uh, uh, the way that Japanese music is made, you know, and, and I tried to emulate that. As I went on, I, I really opened it up a bit because I felt more comfortable. It, people were more receptive and I, and I felt like I could stretch it out by using some basic things that sort of grounded me in Japanese music, but also knowing that people in Japan are, have changed. People, people, we've all changed. We are all evolving. And, and Obon, although it's, it's a tradition that really is one of the main traditions that holds Japanese Americans from all generations together, if it doesn't evolve, then it will die. Yeah. It's not about preserving or fixing culture, no. right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Respecting it, but allowing it to change. Yes. Um, we have a great comment from Randy saying, um, I think he's referring to, to multi night at this point. Um, you know, uh, he, he wrote, this is a great video and idea. It would be good to advertise the term throughout the environmental movement as it encapsulates it really well, especially coming from your grandmother. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you got it, Randy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Let's spread it, you know, it's on YouTube. Spread it and, and I'd love for, you know, people to, because it's, it has a long shelf life because it's on YouTube, so, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we have a question about whether, um, you know, how dance has been part of your activism. It's very clear that music has been. There's a question yes. about dance. You know, I mean, there were, uh, when I first started teaching dance 
after I had been on Troubadour in the Asian <laughs> movement, a dance became, a, I had to learn how to teach dance. And then once I got into it, then I said, hey, I write music, I do dance, let's put these things together. And then I started doing dance, some modern day, I'm creating some modern dance pieces with original music to it. Then it le led into creating a musical called Chop, Chop Suey and Talk Story. So one thing led to another and, um, uh, but the thing about using dance, and especially in the traditional folk dance, is that everybody can participate. You know, it doesn't matter what you look like. It's really a matter of just joining in and uh, forgetting about what you look like, as a matter of fact, just letting go and, and to be in that circle and dancing together. It's embodiment. Uh, there's something powerful about people moving together. It's like, it, it's, it's cosmic, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question from back earlier um, about whether folks in Japan know about you and your work. And especially, do Japanese women know about your work? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, yes, some people do. Not a, not not greatly, uh, but uh, little by little, uh, people have been uh, introduced to obon music from America and recognize that oh my goodness, Japanese Americans they actually love to do this. In fact, we carry the tradition as. Uh, participators much more here than they do in Japan. It's become sort of professionalized in Japan in some spaces. Mm. Other spaces, which I have not seen, they dance for days in the streets. They mm. don't just dance in a circle, they dance in the village and they weave in and out so that you know the whole village will dance. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. Uh, and the story, uh, yes, uh, it's funny when I this first time I ever went to Japan and I spoke, the thing that people related to the most was the fact that I was in West Side Story, and they knew <laughs> West Side Story and they sure. showed West Side Story every year, in theaters in Japan, and so it was a big deal. Um, but you know, I want people to know what Japanese American uh, culture is, and it is distinct from Japanese culture. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I go to Japan, I realize I'm an American. <laughs> and I think they look at me and just the way I move. When my, me and my brother and sister went, you know, we're sitting down and eating with our hashi, with our chopsticks in the restaurant. I said, well, do you feel Japanese now? And my brother looked at me and he said, hell no. <laughs> he said, they, they know that we're not Japanese, you know. <laughs> and, but at the same time, I, I visited our, our family in Fukuoka and uh, realized that they accepted us and they they even accepted the fact that I have a black family, you know. Mm. Uh, and I think my mother would have been very nervous about that because mm. it's people, it's known that Japanese people um, are sort of racist and like many uh, uh, Asian countries, uh, mm. the, the, if you have dark skin, it means that you're from, you know, working class and you're not as accepted. But, you know, these are the things that break more barriers. Mm. Us telling our stories, us exchanging, us going back and forth. And, and yes, it's opening up. It's opening up. Wow. Great answer to complicated matters, right? It is complicated. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one last question. It's a great one from Michael Heffley. Um, about the Trump years, um, you know, what was the impact of the Trump years on your work? Um, and, you know, on the other hand, are you feeling a certain, um, you know, lightning of hopes and spirits now that we're coming out from under? I think that the Trump years brought out what was an undercurrent in America. Uh, it didn't it didn't create a situation it just brought it out and and we all know that once something reaches the sunlight that healing is possible that this is a difficult time and um, for all of us 
especially people who are in the arts and culture. It is a time to really use these uh, tools to, um, to create conversation, to tell stories, to show, uh, and we can show our differences, show our uniqueness, but still be able to, you know, there's a saying that says, you can't kill a man whose story you know. And I really believe that's true. I believe that anti-Asian violence happens because they don't know who we are. They don't know our, they don't know my story. In 1992 in the, in the LA riots uprising, uh, you know, I was on the street and a black kid pointed at me and, uh, and I, then I realized, I said, this, this boy could be my son. He didn't know my story. So I really feel that this is an important moment for all of us, white, black, whatever, to, to keep conversing. Uh, we have to find new ways of doing it, I think. We can't f just force our jam, our, you know, jam ourselves onto somebody. Uh, but we have to find ways and avenues. And music is a wonderful way to do that. I mean, it's done so much already to open people up to change. Um, and it, it can do more. Thank you so much, Nobuko. And thank you, everyone who came today. I think you can see why so many of us have been inspired by Nobuko as a person and inspired through her music and her, her the gatherings, the events, the, the, the communities that she calls into being. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Professor May Han for, for having us, you know, yes, and for you, the great work that you do on your campus. Um, it's very clear. Well, we didn't clear. get to talk about that. We didn't get to talk about the fact that uh, in, here in mid-Tennessee that people are playing Chinese instruments and they're collaborating uh, across uh, cultural borders in a, in, a, in a beautiful way, just like Fandango Bon. If you want to say something about that now, May, May Han. <laughs> Wow, I just learned so much from you, from you too. Uh, it's so inspire, inspiring. And, you know, the first thing you said, you know, do you have a song? And I, that immediately brought back to my childhood. Then that's completely another story. And I came from a center of a, a culture that it was so strong as itself. And I came to North America uh, to gradually become more multicultural. So I think you and I are sort of like two different side of the past, but we're getting closer to each other. So I learned so much from you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you Wonderful. so much for, for inviting us here to be with you, even though I wish I could be there in person to just see you all, to see your faces and, right. and to, uh, to feel your energy. But I, right. I, I really thank you for inviting me into your space. I thank also so want to use this opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Greg Risch, who is director of the uh, Center for Popular Music, which is oh. a Center for American Music. And he's uh, my colleague and he's here. Greg, you, you would like to say something? Well, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Wong and, and especially uh, Ms. Miyamoto for the, this wonderful and inspiring presentation. I confess I don't know much about your music. Uh, I didn't know much about it uh, before today's session, and I've learned a great deal uh, as well. I was particularly intrigued by the uh, collaborative effort you made with uh, with uh, Marta Gonzalez. I've been uh, engaged in Son Jarocho studies and visiting Veracruz and all of that for about the last uh, five oh, years. There's a jarana behind you. So yeah, there's a, <laughs> uh, actually that's a requinto, the four string lead oh, instrument, great. a very, very s similar shape and size. Um, but in any case, uh, that, that resonated with me because I've been in the, the Fandangos uh, down in uh, in Veracruz and that sense of community and the democratization of of that music making and dancing and singing experience is um, is something that I think I, I mean it's, it resonates with me and you know to, to see how you were able to uh, bring together this larger event um, that was uh, you know crossing these these cultural and ethnic 
uh, boundaries in, in positive ways is a very inspiring thing. And that can happen anywhere. I mean, it, it's not, uh, especially you as, as musicians, uh, collaborators, uh, thinking about how do you create conversation uh, through your musical forms, uh, I think is, and, 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 and movement and, and cultures. Uh, we're going to try to do this in Detroit, uh, which is um, connected to Tennessee, I think, through Route 23. <laughs> but when it happens, I'm going to let you know if it happens later this year, because I would love for you to come down and experience Fandango Bone in Detroit. Please do. Right. Please let me know. I'm yes. anxious to hear about that. I hope in the near future we'll have opportunity to invite you to come to our campus. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah, for, for making you yes. know, things flow so beautifully as you always do. And um, Mehan, my gratitude for your being there. Thank you. For being there and doing your work. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. So I also want to thank you. My uh, thank all the guests and uh, my students, and we will have a lot to talk about. And Greta too. Greta. Yes, Greta. Special yes. so, thank you to Greta. Perfect. Go up. Yes. <laughs> I want to just. Uh, you're going to share. We're going to share how we used Van Dango Bone during the uh, uh, COVID era, era in this last video as we go out that uh, people from all over the country uh, contributed to this last video, uh, which is the theme song of Fandango Bone. Welcome everybody, my name is Nobuko Miyamoto. We're gonna learn today a dance called Bambutsu no Tsunagari, which means 10,000 things all connected. Now Fandango comes from Veracruz, Mexico, and Obon, of course, is from the Japanese tradition, which we dance in a circle to remember our ancestors. I'm going to teach you the simple dance, only four steps, very easy, okay? So this is the fun part. You are going to put yourself before your camera and you're going to shoot yourself doing the uh, dance. Circle, dance. One other. For this. You plan, you lose. Okay. For Great. this, with the you plan, right. you lose. Don't plan, just dance. Practice, forget. For this, you plan, you lose. Hey. In the circle we dance, no beginning, no ending. In the
empecemos a remediar con los ancestros del norte. Empecemos a remediar con los ancestros del norte. Que es tiempo de celebrar la vida en Fandango. Que es tiempo de celebrar la vida en Fandango. Thank you. 